In top gear this week, Tiff Nidell on a nostalgic return to Le Mans. Quentin Wilson advises on buying an elderly Volvo. And Jeremy Clarkson joins the ladies at Silverstone. From the moment the first MG rolled out of the doors in 1930, the Abingdon plant had been a happy factory. In fact, it became the most strike-free plant in BMC. And the sports cars it produced were huge export earners for the company and the country. At one time, 40,000 MGBs a year were being built to satisfy the American demand. But in 1980, the last MGB rolled down the line and the factory was shut, a cruel reward for the plant and the workforce that had been shamefully treated and starved of investment. But today, the MGB lives again in this, the new RV8, concrete proof that Abingdon was right all along because this is the car they could have built here in this factory when it was first proposed 20 years ago. The fact that it's possible to build this car 14 years after production ceased is down to the love and enthusiasm that still remains for the MGB and the sheer number of the cars still on the road. Now, because of that, it made sound economic sense to find all the old body tools and recreate the MGB body shell for people who wanted to rebuild their old cars. The fact they got the body shell meant that they could build this car, the new RV8. OK, there's some subtle and attractive styling changes. The flared rear arches and the great big fat alloy wheels. At the back, there's colour-coded bumpers and new tail light treatment. But at its heart, it's still an MGB. It's powered by the 3.9-litre Range Rover V8, 190 brake horsepower and massive mid-range torque. Claim top speed is almost 140 miles an hour, but more impressive is the sheer grunt. Push your foot down and get instant acceleration. It's very high-geared too. If it wasn't for the wind noise, you'd almost call it relaxed cruising. They spend a great deal of time trying to get rolled holding, handling and brakes up to modern standards. But the ride still feels too harsh and it does crash on bumps and rough surfaces. My main criticism is the seats. They're beautifully trimmed in soft leather, but they're just too high. In the old MG, you snuggle down in the cockpit. In this car, you seem to sit up and your head is above the level of the screen rail. That means you get a lot of the slipstream. Tall drivers would be very uncomfortable and Jeremy would be picking the blue bottles off his teeth. You're also very conscious that your, your eye level is about the same as the header rail over the screen. And with the hood up, that means you spend a lot of your time peering under it at crossroads to see the traffic lights. I found the instruments a bit small, though the cockpit is beautifully trimmed. A lovely wooden dashboard, leather trim everywhere and thick carpets, a far cry from the Spartan interior of those very first MGs. Now, at this point, I have to declare an interest. This is not the normal unbiased road test of a new car, because a few years ago, I bought an MGB drophead fitted with a tuned Rover V8 engine. It's fitted with the Rover 5-speed gearbox, a high-ratio back axle, and the suspension and brakes have been uprated to cope with the power, and I love it. Now, Abingdon built the MGB GT with the V8 engine, but they never built this car, the Open Tourer. Why not? Well, I can't tell you. I know a man who can. As senior MG designer at the time, Don Hayter knows the reasons why. Mainly, I think, because the supply of engines just didn't warrant it. Uh, we were controlled by the number that uh, Range Rover converted at the uh, Acox Green factory to a, a maximum of about 48 a week, so that it wasn't worth doing any more than the GT version. 
This is Don's own MGB V8, a car he made himself after the factory closed. It's a superb device, but does it give him any regrets? Oh, of course it does. Um, seeing the RV8 come along uh, all this time afterwards says that there would have been room for a car like this. I would just like to have engineered it and put it into on sale myself. Now, the RV8 is not going to be a cheap car. Rover say they'll hold the price of £25,500 for the first 250 examples, most of which are pre-sold anyway. It's tempting to make comparisons with cars like mine and Don's here. Get yourself a good MGB Tourer or even a Heritage body shell and make your own V8 for half the amount. But that's to ignore the vast amount of engineering and design work that's gone into making a car to fit today's demanding road conditions, the restyled interior and the new engine and drivetrain, without sacrificing any of the classic appeal. Rover say it's aimed at someone who'd like to own a red E-type Jaguar without the fear of breakdowns or discomfort. In other words, a classic car without the drawbacks. If that's their aim, they've certainly succeeded, as long as they lower those seats. Forty years ago, Tony Rolt and Duncan Hamilton scored Jaguar's second victory at Le Mans in their worked C-Type. It was a great year for Jaguar, with C-Types also finishing second, fourth and ninth, with Sterling Moss sharing second place in car 17. To mark the anniversary, Sterling led a cavalcade of C-Types on a pilgrimage from Coventry to this year's Le Mans 24-hour race. En route, they dropped in on the Bloxham factory where the XJ220 is produced, a car that was about to face its first Le Mans. True British summer weather accompanied the cars on their cruise south as they headed for the shelter and warmth of the cross-channel ferry. The Le Mans circuit is a few hours' drive the other side of the channel, and warm sunshine greeted the sea types as they were prepared for an emotional demonstration run around the circuit. There have been changes, but the basic circuit layout is as it was 40 years ago, and it was easy for the drivers to imagine the years rolling away and that they themselves were racing at Le Mans. And his allied, a Ferrari, a Jaguar, Moss, I think. And on the fourth lap, Moss passes Villarese. So it's Jaguar, Ferrari, Jaguar. England versus Italy. The Le Mans start. What a fantastic sight. Sterling Moss wins a sprint, and he's away. Just watch him weaving his way through Alphas and Ferraris. Meanwhile, the leading supercars were already lapping the other Jaguars in what could be their last Le Mans before the production GTs take over, a concept Jaguar chairman Nick Shaler wholly endorses. I personally believe it's the wave of the future. We've got to get back to reasonably priced racing, and this is the way I think. GTs also, I believe, are just what people are waiting to see. They want to see race, racing cars that they can see on the road as well, and maybe buy one day also. On track, the leaders were working hard inside the hot, claustrophobic confines of their cars. Peugeot battled with Toyota for overall honours. Down the long Mulsanne Strait, broken up nowadays by two third-gear chicanes, but still seeing speeds of over 200 miles an hour. Lights ablaze, the leaders fight on, while the remaining Jaguars continue to pound round in their quest for class victory, with pit work as important now as it's always been. Perhaps the pace was a little more leisurely in the old days, 
and overalls were more functional than fashionable, but the skills were just the same. Do more than the chasing Porsche Carrera. Well, I may not have raced at Le Mans this year, but I have driven that very Jaguar. Watch out for my test later in the series. There was a time back in the mid-70s when the Volvo 240 occupied its very own market niche. A solid, respectable, middle-class workhorse. Saloons were bought by earnest types who weren't interested in glitz, glamour and grunt, and the estates were seen as safe suburban carryalls, ideal for those conscious, calming runs to the bottle bank. In fact, at one stage, the estate was even considered vaguely trendy. You remember? Anybody with county aspirations, a couple of dogs, wife with a headscarf, simply had to have one. In their day, they were classless, gentrified, even rather swish. Buyers liked the 240 because they thought it was a big car with a conscience. They saw it as indestructible, kind to the environment and frugal. For a decade, those caring Volvo owners plonked in their Richard Clayderman cassettes and trundled sedately round in their 240s, basking in a glow of self-satisfaction. But the passage of time has not been kind to the 240. Its perpendicular breeze block styling first saw the light of day in 1966 in the form of the old Volvo 144. Freshened up in 1974 with big bumpers and a facelift, it remained virtually unchanged for 20 years. Yet it's not a bad car, just well past its sell-by date, and that is its problem. Driving one is as exciting as musily without milk. Now, I'm not about to praise the 240, but by the same token, I'm not going to bury it either. The problem is, it's one of those cars whose reputation rests rather precariously on its past laurels. In terms of dynamics, design, performance and handling, it's positively pensionable. So. The questions I'm going to be asking today are just how green is your Volvo, how economical, how easy to live with, and is there, given the scores of more modern cars available, any justification for buying one at all? The Volvo 240 is perhaps not quite as economical as people might have us believe. Typically, on a local journey, you'd get low 20s miles to the gallon. On a motorway type run, you'd probably go to high 20s, low 30s. They're perhaps not quite as green as we would be led to believe either. Many of them need modifying before they can take 95 octane unleaded fuel and some of them actually need a second head gasket which can work out quite expensive. Having said that, the later generation cars do tend to be able to use unleaded fuel without any attention at all. So if they're not that green and hardly border on the frugal, what about that famous reputation for lasting forever? Generally speaking, they're a strong old tool. Um, they will or can return some phenomenal mileages. This one, for example, is an f -Reg car, 85,000 miles. It's still a baby. It runs as sweet as a nut. But on the downside, some of the parts can be really quite expensive. Take, for example, this corner trim. You're looking here, 45 pounds, just for a bit of rubber. The front grille, if you're involved in a, a little shunt, you're talking 107. And if your electric window gets stuck down, you're talking 200 quid's worth of wet shoulder for the motor, and that's before it's fitted. We compared some retail parts prices for a Volvo 240 GL and a Vauxhall Carlton 2-litre GL, and found the Volvo ones a bit on the dear side. So they're a tough old workhorse, as hard-wearing as a reindeer hooves, but I have another reservation about buying a second-hand one and it's about their depreciation and desirability. Now, there was a time when a good second-hand 240 would make big money, but that's not the case anymore. They're not in demand anymore. 
Because the 240 has lost its image, has dated fiercely and isn't that economical, they've started to lose their value rather quicker than they used to. On the positive side though, they are cheap to buy. A half-decent white plate car can be bought for less than £1,500 and a fresh-looking 50,000-mile D-plate 240 GLT like this one is likely to be only 2,500 territory. And that's roughly £1,000 less than the equivalent second-hand Granada or Carlton. And if you are going to be a prospective owner, remember that the estates hold their value better than the saloons and the post-86 240s had galvanised lower bodies, which means less rust. Most important, though, make sure you found one with power steering. Without it, they're as agile as the Lord Chief Justice in full ceremonial regalia. So, if you can live with the heavy appetite for jungle juice, questionable depreciation, pricey parts and all the performance of an armoured personnel carrier, you could do a lot worse. But on the other hand, you could do a lot better. Like a Volvo 740, a Vauxhall Carlton, a Ford Granada, a Peugeot 405 Estate. Today it isn't. Ordinarily, Silverstone is a place where men come to watch other men prancing around with a lot of foliage around their much risked necks. But today it's been taken over by women who have come here in the name of charity to prove that they are every bit as good behind the wheel as their men folk. For some of them, though, that could be a tall order. This is the Racy Ladies' Day, a day when 80 or so women were invited to come along and play cars. There were eight teams and eight disciplines, including arcade games, a slalom auto test, quad bikes and skid cars. Now, they had fun. They had a lot of fun. And it begged the question, why don't more women do this kind of thing more often? I don't know. I think women have probably got a stronger survival instinct and... Men take their brains out and leave them in a little box at home and go off and do all the car racing and everything. David, what do you think about there being virtually no women in motorsport? Is that something you can... doesn't even enter your head, or...? I think maybe there should be a category for women. I mean, in any other sport, you've got a category for women to compete, so in tennis and golf and athletics, and I think motor racing shouldn't be any different. If they made a category specifically for women to compete in, then it would be a little bit... A little bit more fair. Yeah. So today then, today's a good opportunity for yeah. you to get out there and show your husbands what, yeah. it, what you're made of. For Tommy's campaign, which um, is research into fetal development and why some babies are born too soon. And you know, we have two little boys who are perfectly healthy, and I had fantastic pregnancies, and we didn't have any trouble having them at all, which is great. So um, it's nice to be able to do something to help women who don't have such an easy time of it. So it's a serious event, but as you can see, it's a fun one too, which is one of the reasons why I don't feel the slightest bit embarrassed to take the mickey out of the competitors. Well, one of them in particular. You see, on the journalist team was our very own Michelle Newman. She was good too. She could easily make her quad bike do six or seven miles an hour. I do apologise if you're waiting to see the travel show. She'll be finished shortly. Hang on, what are we doing this afternoon? Let Michelle, me Michelle, listen, what? I've just got the results right. Yeah. You're coming seven. Oh, that's great, that's great. How many teams are there? Oh, uh, quite a lot, really. How many? Eight. <laughs> So, Laura, despite the footwear, you, you seem to be pretty fast out there. What's the trick? I think just keep your foot down and go for it, really. You, you can't turn them over anything, so it's just a bit of fun. 
you must have had some practice. Yeah, we always try and find some uh, go-kart circuits on the, on the pro golf tour. We always manage to find some out and go out there and have a bit of fun. The skid cars, though, designed to over or understeer at the touch of a button, were really sorting out the women from the girls. Is that you again? No, it was not me again. <laughs> Now, Martin, for once, I don't want to talk to you. Liz, you've just <laughs> done the fastest time. Um, how did it feel? Well, I, it was quite nerve-wracking, and you had to concentrate very hard on what you were doing, but um, as long as you kept the car smooth, it wasn't too bad. What are you looking forward to next? Oh, gosh. I think uh, I'm quite looking forward to the slalom, actually, in the Peugeots. Any tips, Martin? Be smooth, go fast, don't crash. It's what they tell us in the Formula One driver's briefing, it's the same thing. You obviously don't listen, then. So has it been, uh, has it been fun today? Fantastic. And how do you think you've done on the slalom? Um, if I hadn't forgotten to stop back there, I think I'd have done a lot better. <laughs> Which has been your favourite? The track, definitely. So at last, have we managed to find somebody who really would like to be a racing driver? Oh, in another life, I would love to be a racing driver. Really hard, all the way around, look in this mirror and find the cones. Hold, stop, stop, stop. Hit them brakes, hit them brakes. OK, right. Pull it off, hit them brakes. The celebrity team was made up of actresses, singers and, yes, celebrities. Now, are they looking forward to driving the truck? Yes, I am, actually. I mean, I've seen enough of these lorries in my life, moving house, one time or another, and, yes, I'm actually eager to do this. It's something I've never done before. It's a did challenge. You, do you think you're going to do well? Um, oh, I'd never... Oh, I, would, I'm, I don't take bets. <laughs> Hello. Hello there. She should have taken that bet because the judges said Sherry was just about the best they'd seen all day. Perhaps the hardest discipline, though, was in the pits. They had to change all four wheels on an F1 McLaren. Looks like a brutish man's job, but Michelle was in confident mood. Right, got the gloves, got the car, got the wheel. They make such a big deal of it. 4.6 seconds, the record, just no problem. We got it sussed. Amazingly, one team did this in less than nine seconds. But I'm afraid it wasn't this one. Now, Mika, that was a 16-second stop. How would that put you in the race? Uh, I would definitely, definitely lost the lead. Definitely <laughs> lost the lead? Well, you would have done last. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How do you think this lot is doing? Well, they need some practice. <laughs> The event raised £60,000 and was won by the Racing Drivers Wives team. The Duchess of York handed out the trophies, but Michelle missed the spectacle. They'd made a walk back to the pits. Remember our car quality and reliability survey? Well, the response has been nothing short than brilliant. Nearly 60,000 of you called, virtually overwhelming us, so we're sorry if some of you didn't get through. We've closed the telephone lines and will now pass on the information to our expert statisticians who will then decide if we've got enough j -Reg cars to form an accurate cross-section. But we are impressed and encouraged that so many of you care so much about our campaign to build better cars. And we hope that this is just the beginning, that there will be further surveys of cars of all ages and another chance for you to take part. So watch this space. In next week's Top Gear, sporting BMWs back to back. The British Rally Championship goes down to the wire. And Ford and Nissan enter the expanding off-road sector.